welcome back to the Rich Fritzky Show. I'm sorry, I'm a little late getting back to you. Can't help but begin this one without focusing upon my abiding love for the game. I turned 71 this month, but the young boy in me lives and comes so alive at this time of year. Come spring, comes that sweet old feeling. It's baseball. My Yankees are back. I can see the larger-than-life stadiums and the expansive greens of the field, images of the American frontier and the metaphorical journeys home again. Baseball is the only major sport that isn't played against the clock, but only against the ball. It's Yogi's legendary, it ain't over till it's over, and his, it gets late early out there. I was at Yankee Stadium when Ted Williams hit his last home run and when Madeline Maris roamed the outfield and when a guy with one arm pitched a no-hitter and my Ron Guidry struck out 18 and Derek Jeter flew into the stands at 30 miles per hour to catch a foul pop-up and Don Mattingly at first base caught not one, not two, not three, but four runners trying to go to third in one game. My brother Frank and I would catch the bus on Main Street in Hackensack, a bus that would take us to the stadium in the Bronx on home Sundays, doubleheader days. A quarter would get us into the bleachers and a brown bag lunch would carry us from game to game. Bologna, liverwurst, or peanut butter and jelly it was. And there were the days that I lived in Boston and had mayor's office passes that would get me into Fenway, where I'd boldly cheer in enemy territory. When back in Jersey, pre-Maggie, and my many children, I had season tickets for four seasons. Box 428F in the Loge, right behind home plate. But as I have often reminded my own, My great sacrifice was, yes, I had to give up my Yankee season tickets for a family. I can see myself alone in Nana's Glockamora at Crater Lake watching the Yanks' afternoon games on WPIX. There in an oversized chair in a dark room, bathing suit on, alone, while everyone else was down at the lake enjoying the beautiful sunshine. I'd sit watching a fuzzy eight and one half inch Philco black and white TV. I could hardly make out the field, much less the players. But more than 60 years later, I could still share the batting order that included Maris in right field, Mickey in center, Yogi catching, and a favorite of mine back then, Bobby Richardson at second base. And one of the three announcers for TV and radio was the old scooter, Phil Rizzuto. Italian to the bone, he never stopped talking about family, his car, his home in Hillside, New Jersey, his fear of thunder, lightning, and planes, and oh, how he loved to wish fans happy birthday, kibitzing with them as if he were family, and yes, from time to time, he'd even get back to the game. All this background, my friends, just to get to him, to Phil Rizzuto, who I would first meet at a lunch arranged by a great old friend of mine who got him to bring me an autograph, Ron Guidry Glove, one of my most beloved of Yankees. Years later, my boys and I would notice Phil and his wife Cora in their car in Milford, New York, while we were on our way to my Aunt Dot's. My sons were waving at him excitedly, so he kindly pulled over, as did I. My sons shot out of the car to talk to him. And while he was delightful, their flying high was the infamous anxiety that he introduced us to over his time broadcasting. I learned much about him just listening to him. This time, it was his apoplexy as to my boys being on an open street. Their dad, me, I could have cared less. Traffic was roughly one car per minute. Yes, Phil Rizzuto, shortstop for the New York Yankees, a most valuable player in the American League, a popular broadcaster, and a Hall of Famer enshrined as he was in baseball's Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. I grew up with the terms he immortalized with his holy cows and huckleberries. A great play was always awarded a holy cow. And anyone doing anything strange or stupid was a huckleberry. He passed away less than a year after he left the Kessler Institute. 
where I got to live with him for many months. He was loved, and his career was wildly celebrated and remembered. The press and the media and his beloved Yankees did him great justice. The team itself wore a number 10 memorial band honoring him throughout the 2007 season. But they missed, everybody missed, in fact, the final chapter of his life. And there was no mention of the waning years, months, and moments. While they revered the announcer and the ball player, they missed the dignity and the sweetness of the 88 and 89-year-old Phil, the patient who treated all others with such grace. To write was difficult for him, and his hands would shake, and it was hard. But he never turned down requests for an autograph, and to merely sign his name was never enough. He had to lead each and every time with his immortal, holy cow. He had to do each and every fan justice. He had to go the extra mile because he loved people, welcomed their embrace, their touch, and smile. When I saw him on my first Saturday there, my son Tommy just pushed me over to his table in the courtyard. He and his daughter Pat welcomed us. The conversation took off. We all laughed. And 55-year-old me and 88-year-old Phil became fast friends. He was there to regain strength and movement. I was there to regain life. And somehow I became his touchstone. For long, I thought it was he who needed me. But I've long since come to the realization that this cut both ways. We talk about the present-day Yankees and our wives and our children and his days on the road with the Yankees and his first glove and his storied relationship with arguably the greatest ball player in history, the Yankee Clipper, Joe DiMaggio. The incredibly handsome DiMaggio, Ernest Hemingway's DiMaggio, Marilyn Monroe's DiMaggio, the slick and smooth fielding ball player with the swing of a god who was so reclusive and quiet. Whenever my brothers and I would be watching a game and celebrating a marvelous miracle of a catch in the outfield, my dad would invariably, almost derisively say, the Maggio would have been there waiting to catch that ball. He could have caught it in his back pocket. Students of the game indeed knew that it was Phil Rizzuto, the scooter alone, to whom DiMaggio turned when the chips were down or he was down. We talked about the day DiMaggio's still extraordinary 56-game hitting streak ended. Phil lurked behind in the locker room with him, and they walked the streets of the city together for literally hours afterwards. But when it came time for Joe to enter a familiar bar, they separated. There Phil said I was dismissed. When Joe was going to really drink, it was going to be alone. Now everyone knows that I have a big mouth, Phil added, and it's difficult for me to shut up, but I got along so well with Joe because I also knew how to listen. Joe was a man of few words, and I respected the fact that he was never looking for more than a few words in return. So there was a lot of silence between us. Joe was comfortable with silence, but I could also make him laugh and smile. What a remarkable face DiMaggio had, and when he smiled, holy cow. As for Phil, with full-frocked head of hair, rich tan, and agility, there were parts of him that still seemed to be oh so very young. A good day for Phil was any day that Cora was coming to visit. He didn't care one iota about his celebrity while celebrating others like his close friend Yogi, who visited regularly, and Billy Martin, Hank Bauer, and Ellie Howard, the first African-American ball player on the Yanks. Phil was the salt of the earth, as unaffected as he was when he first walked into the Yankees' locker room. Far too small to play, he looked, so officials literally tried to usher him out refusing to believe that he was actually a ball player. I had friends, Sonny and Lorraine, who kindly brought me baked goods from the B&W Bakery in Hackensack every Sunday morning. They'd schlep from Emerson to Hackensack to West Orange with the crumb cakes and the cheese danishes and the jelly donuts. 
Phil and his daughter Pat would invariably be there on the courtyard to enjoy this with us. Phil's prescribed diet got tossed out on Sunday morning in deference to the concoctions of the greatest bakery on earth. Little piece after little piece after little piece. One not a cloud in the sky weekend afternoon took me by surprise. For as I rolled out into the courtyard, I saw an atypically despondent Phil. No smile, he just kept mildly shaking his hands and looking up at me, imploringly lost. For the record, Phil occasionally had trouble expressing and completing thoughts. It was all right there, but there were times when he just couldn't get it out. I, through this grace of God, had a knack of knowing where he was going, of knowing just what he wanted to say, and I knew where he was on this fine day. As he shook his hands and kept repeating, I used to be able to, I used to be able. Sometimes all of us get a little bit misty over our used to be ables. Instinctively, I reached out for his still strong hands, clasped them and said, it's all still there, Phil. We can't watch a Yankee game today without seeing you lay down the perfect bunt. Every Yankee game I see it, Phil, to this very day, we all watch what you did and sit back and wonder. The best damn glove I ever saw, Phil. It was yours, and Ted Williams was damn right. You were the reason those great Red Sox teams just couldn't beat your Yankees. You were and will ever be one hell of a sight to see. And I watch your Yankeeography, all 60 minutes of it, 60 minutes of you, and all I can say is, holy cow. He just looked up at me with tears in his eyes and a reluctant grin on his face. You have some nerve, he said. Why do you have to go and make me cry? But all was right with the world again, and I just held his hands a bit longer. On another gorgeous Sunday afternoon in either late July or early August, Phil was all over the Yankee game earlier. Pictures of him in action, clips from Phil Rizzuto Day when they gave him the cow. I mean, he was widely featured. It turned out that Derek Jeter was on that day going to break Phil's record for the most games ever played by a Yankee shortstop. Now, Phil may well have been watching the game, and been oblivious to all of this. So I looked forward to seeing him later that afternoon. When I did, I asked him if he watched the game, and he said, some. I said, so you didn't see what happened today? And he said, no. I added, you really didn't catch the big news today, Phil? And he said, no. One more time, I asked him. One more time, he said, no. So I leaned toward him and said with heavy and disturbing emphasis, Phil, today was the day Derek Jeter broke your record of having played the most games of any Yankee shortstop in history. Without skipping a beat, and with all the fervor and vibrancy of the announcer he was, he literally bellowed, kind of shouted out, why that damned Huckleberry? The broad smile and laugh punctuated those words. For Phil, it never got tougher or meaner or gentler than Huckleberry. My friends Joe and Betty and my sons Frank and Joey were there with us to enjoy that memorable moment. He just smiled that rich smile and laughed and laughed in the wake of his performance. About a month later, Phil was to leave Kessler. On the Sunday before he left, his family planned an 89th birthday bash for him there. It was a wonderful afternoon in the Kessler common room with so much family and so many friends and more cannolis than anyone had ever seen before. Table and, I mean, mountain-sized cannolis, surrounded by large cannolis, normal cannolis, finger-sized cannolis. And there were baseball clips and family clips and Italian music and all of the warmth and heart that an Italian-American family can muster. My Sonny and Lorraine actually brought the birthday cakes from, yes, our B&W Bakery in Hackensack. Phil had been appropriately seated at the center of a head table while I was lurking in the background, which was just where I felt that I belonged. 
But Phil suddenly blurts out something to the effect of, no, no, this is all wrong. And he asked them to take him out of there. And he had them roll his chair over to me in the back. And he settled by my side and said, now this is much better. And there we sat, just as we had over the course of months of Kessler afternoons and evenings. My friend Phil, one of the best damn baseball players in the history of our national pastime, a most valuable player, a Hall of Famer, and most importantly, one of the most decent human beings you could have ever possibly gotten to know. Yes, there we sat, his right hand over my fingerless left hand on his 89th birthday, smiling together. I know he's gone, but I still see him often, and I laugh and smile whenever I do, just as I did when we whiled away the hours at Kessler. Of course, he belongs to posterity and to Yankee legend and to the family he deeply loved, but a piece of him lives right here in my own heart, and there he'll stay until I see him on the other side. Oh, I forgot to tell you about Kessler yogi sightings when pandemonium would break out. But that's a tale for another day. Smile on your brothers and sisters. Take care, my friends. <laughs>